Last week I began a new a series of messages with you called This Way Up, and the idea behind this is that I believe God is calling us to raise our faith to new heights, to go higher and higher with him. But the thing that we talked about last week is, well, that's a struggle. It's difficult because we have our will and God has his will, and sometimes they don't go together. But God wants us to continue to raise our faith, not just so that we'd be more faithful, but that we might receive the good things that he wants for us. And that is what this passage is all about that we're going to read this morning. So if you would turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, we hadn't have one below you in the seat, and I encourage you all to grab a Bible and follow along, because we're going to refer back to this passage a number of times this morning. Galatians chapter 5, and we will read verses 16 through the end of the chapter, which is verse 26. Galatians 5, and begin reading with verse 16. Listen closely, for this is the word of the Lord for you. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. And may God bless to us this reading of his holy word to him be our power and glory and authority forever. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Almighty God, as we turn to your word this morning, as always, we pray that you'd remove me from the way and that you would send your spirit that we might hear these words and know that they come from you. And so we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking about this whole struggle that it, we were talking about that is contained not only in, in the, all of the New Testament, but also in Galatians chapter 5. And I remember seeing a demonstration once that I really thought was very helpful in understanding this. So I'm going to ask my lovely assistant, Bill Bateman, if he will get the props that I need for this demonstration. Let me just put it right here, Bill. Thank you. Everybody give a round of applause. Vanna Bateman, everybody. (laughs) Okay, on this, uh, in this demonstration, in Galatians chapter 5, it really talks about two kinds of people and two kinds of lives. There are those who live according to the Spirit, and there are those who live according to the flesh. And we're going to talk about what that means in a moment. But what I have here is I have two glasses Uh, For those of you Presbyterians in the back, there are two glasses of water here. And these glasses of water represent our lives. One according to the flesh, one according to the Spirit. Now, what Paul says is that we are filled with the Spirit. And so what I want to to suggest to you is I have these tablets of Alka-Seltzer. And this Alka-Seltzer represents the Holy Spirit. And when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are transformed. And you can see the Alka-Seltzer is doing its thing in this glass of water. And if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit will transform us as well. It will change us into something else. Or maybe. Now, 
those of you in the back can't see this, maybe, but there is a, I put the Alka-Seltzer in this glass as well, but it's not doing anything. Now, in this one, it's doing its thing, but in this one, it's not doing a single thing. Now, what's the difference? Well, the difference, of course, obviously, is I left the Alka-Seltzer in the package in this one. So it's not able to do anything. For those of you in the back who can't see. <laughs> now, now, the point here is this. We Christians all have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. If we are a Christian, we by default have the Spirit in us. We don't have any more spirit than anybody else, and we don't have less spirit than anybody else. Sometimes there are those traditions who will say uh, that we have more spirit, more of the Holy Spirit than uh, somebody else. That simply is not true. But in some of us, the case is this, that the Holy Spirit is within us, but doesn't seem to be doing very much. Doesn't seem to be transforming us, doesn't seem to be very active, just sort of there. So what is the difference? Well, in, in this little illustration, the package keeps that Alka-Seltzer from doing its thing. So what is the package? What does the package represent? What is it in your life that prevents the Holy Spirit from doing his thing? What is it in your life that contains that Holy Spirit and prevents him from doing something amazing in you? What does this package represent in your life? This is what I want to talk about with you this morning. Now, Paul, in Galatians chapter 5, he writes about these two glasses. Well, that is, he writes about these two lies. If you turn back to that passage you were looking at, Galatians chapter 5, I want us to look at verse 16 again. Because in in this passage, he uses one of his favorite analogies, and that is the contrast between spirit and in flesh. And you see that in verse 16. He reads, Live by the spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. Live according to the spirit. That's basically Paul's main point. But what he actually wrote there is not live by the Spirit, but walk according to the Spirit. See, the idea is that we, that we are taking uh, steps, that we walk, and as we go about our lives, we do so under the auspices of the Holy Spirit, that we live according to what the Spirit is guiding us. That is an ant antithesis to the flesh. So you have these two things opposing one another, flesh and spirit. Now, I want to be very careful, and, and we're going to talk about that contrast, but I want to be careful about des describing these terms to you. You know, whenever I read the Apostle Paul and I come across the word flesh in his letters, I often think of sexual stuff. Isn't, isn't that what you think of when you come across the word flesh in the Bible, sexual things? Okay, maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that says something about me. Hmm. But uh, okay, I think you, you were afraid to nod your head. But I think most of us, when we come across the word flesh in, in the New Testament, we naturally think uh, of sexual stuff. And that may be part of it. It certainly is part of it. But that's, Paul has something far more in mind than that. When he uses the word flesh, he's talking about this power. This power that is in the world and in our lives that keeps us from God. That keeps us from living out our life in the reality of God's grace. When he writes about flesh, he's talking about this thing that can enslave us. This thing that can chain us. This thing that can keep us from following more closely Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, sometimes that is a sexual-related thing. We live in a very sexualized culture, and it's no real surprise that for some people, it is something sexual that keeps them back. But there's more than that. 
For some of us, it might be not just pleasure, but maybe it's the, the collection of things and money and, and possessions. Maybe we're so bent on doing that that it enslaves us. Maybe it's power. I don't know what it is for you, but there is something in your life that is holding you back from experiencing that. There is some Elka-Seltzer package that is probably holding you back. So what is it for you? That's what Paul means by the flesh. Now, his passage says that is in contrast, and it is in opposition to the spirit. Now, we need to be clear here. He's not saying just sort of the spirit or, or spirituality or spiritual things or even to your spirit. What he is saying is that is in opposition to the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, that these, this power in the world that controls us, this flesh, is in direct opposition to the spirit, to God himself. See, there is this thing that wants to oppose God, and then there is God. And this is the struggle that we see in our souls. This is the thing that we really work through. Like I said, in Galatians 5.16, the word there is actually walk. We walk according to the Spirit. We live our lives, this is Paul's encouragement to us, we live our lives according to the Spirit, not according to the thing that chains us down. Not according to the thing that holds us into bondage. And if we are walking according to the Spirit, we will by default not be walking according to the flesh. And if we do that, our lives are gonna be transformed like that glass of water was transformed. Our lives are gonna show different outcomes depending upon who we follow. In fact, in this passage, Paul does, what he does is he has a whole list of examples. Let's look at the first one, verses 19 through 21. This is an example, there's a whole bunch of examples here of what's gonna happen if you walk according to the flesh. It says, now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, Impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Biblical scholars call that kind of list a vice list. Because there's all these vices, all these things that are meant to be bad. And, and according to Paul, they're obvious. They're, they're, the list is not supposed to be a list of good things. And when we listen, listen to the list, we go, some of them's not so bad. You know, jealousy, yeah, okay. Envy, you know, that's not such a bad thing. Fornication sounds okay. <laughs> the word fornication there, we just might as well unpack this one right now. The word fornication there, the Greek word is pornea, where we get the word pornography. And the idea there is, of course, not pornography, but pornea refers to all sexual sin. All sexual sin that is in opposition to God. Sexual sin that enslaves us and chains us. That's the point. That's the point. But what I want you to notice is that it is not a closed list. Look how the passage ends in verse 21. And things like these. In other words, there are more that you could add to this list. You know, there's that favorite sin that you have in your life. The one that you committed 267 times this morning. <laughs> you know that one? You could add that to this list. You could add that to this list just as well as any of these other things. See, the things that are opposite are opposing God, things that hold us down. And you know what they are. Remember, if the Spirit lives in us, we not only have Scripture guiding us as to what is sin, we have the Spirit living within us that is reminding us that this is in opposition to God. It's as if the Spirit is whispering into our souls. 
this is wrong. And you know this is wrong, and you know this is wrong because of the way it makes you feel. I almost think that we Christians have kind of a litmus test in our souls, that when we do something, we might rationalize, we might try to explain, but deep down, we know what's wrong. We know, and why do we know what's wrong? Because the Spirit is living inside of us. And the list is long. By contrast, though, the outcome for those who live according to the Spirit is a whole different set of outcomes. If you would skip down to verses 22 and 23. Paul writes, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Doesn't that sound nice? Gentleness and peace. And when you come across somebody whose life is characterized by these things, generosity and peace and kindness, don't you admire them? Don't you think they're great? Don't you wish you had more of that in your life? I want to point out to you that what Paul does here is he uses an organic analogy. He says that these qualities, these outcomes, are the fruit of, of the Spirit. Have you ever wondered why he would choose fruit? Well, it's not just because they're sweet, but because they grow. So we don't begin with these things, but if we cultivate a life, if we cultivate a life in the Spirit, these things in us will grow. The seeds have been planted, they have been been nurtured, and they will grow up, and the result is we will have these qualities in our life. And then we can feel good about ourselves. These are qualities that will transform who we are. These are the outcomes. These are the good things that God wants for us. So then what keeps you from that? What is it that is stopping that growth of the fruits of the Spirit in your life? What is the package in your life? Let's go back to this metaphor here. What is it that is going to let the Spirit out in our life? What is it that, what is it going to take for the package to be opened and the seltzer to be put in the water? What is it that is going to let the Spirit loose in our lives? Well, I think, first of all, it is a willful decision to open that package. It is a willful decision to let the Spirit loose in our lives. The Apostle Paul is going to make the same point in another passage of Scripture. If you have that Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And I want to read a couple of verses, verses 5 and 6. Romans 8. Paul begins in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh, stop there. For those who walk according to the flesh. There's that word again. For those who walk according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. See, it's not only about a willful decision, it's about what we set our minds on. It's what we think about. It's what we fill our minds with. You know, I learned a long time ago, there's that old phrase, garbage in, garbage out. If we fill our minds full of garbage, we will get garbage out of our lives. If we fill our minds with pornea, pornography, selfish ambition, power, these kinds of these things, if we are wrapped around gaining more and more of that, then we're going to have garbage out in our lives. But if we fill our minds with the things of the Spirit, It will be a cultivation. It will transform us. So how do you get there? Well, you have to think God's thoughts after him. Albert Einstein once said, 
I want to think all of God's thoughts. Everything else is details. Everything else is details. I want to think God's thoughts. I think that Einstein is kind of arguing Paul's point in Romans. That we need to think God's thoughts after him. How do you do that? Well, I think the most obvious thing, the first step, is we need to be in Scripture. We need to be in God's Word for us. We need to struggle with it. We need to read it. We need to contend with it. There is no substitute for that. If you're going to let the Spirit loose in your life, you're going to have to begin with this book. And you might say, well, I don't know where to begin. I, you know, that's a big intimidating thing, and I don't know where to be in. Well, how convenient for you. We happen to have a class in this church called Disciple. You heard a little bit about this morning. And Disciple is a great thing. Because Disciple can take you from a place where you're intimidated from Scripture to a place where you're immersed in it. And you read it every day. And it has the possibility of speaking to you. And you are filling your, you're setting your mind on the things of God. Maybe where you need to begin this morning is you need to go out into the fellowship hall and you need to go to the information table and there you can get information and I believe you can even sign up. Isn't that convenient? It's a great place for you to begin. But it's more than that. I think if we're going to set our minds on spiritual things, the things of God, that's going to require that we spend time in prayer. And I don't mean laundry list kinds of prayer. You know, where we go to God, we say, God, you need to do this, this, and this, and this, this, and amen, thank you for doing all of that. I mean the kind of prayer where God can fill your mind, where the Spirit can speak, where the Spirit can be let loose in your soul, that kind of of prayer that's going to require you to do what we talked to, we're going to talk about in a week or so, and that is just shut up. Listen. Maybe what you need to do is you need to spend time processing the faith with other people. You need to talk about not only what you read here, but the struggles you have in applying what you read here. See, I think the Christian life is meant to be done together. And if you're not in a group or a small group, you need to be in one because that's where the fruit is nurtured. Not just worship, but processing the faith. These are all good things, and these are the things that you need to be in. And if you do that, you'll go a long way to letting the Spirit loose in your life. One last verse I want to show you. Galatians chapter 5, in verse 25. It says, if we live by the Spirit, if we walk by the Spirit, if we live by the Spirit, let us be guided by the Spirit. Another word for walk there. And the word there is that we need to walk being guided by the Spirit. That we need to step in the Spirit's steps. You know, the imagery there that I think of is, I, I saw a, a war movie one time, and, and it was winter, and the, there was a minefield. And one of the soldiers had successfully crossed this minefield. All of the other soldiers then walked and stepped in his steps. I think that's the imagery here. That if we're to keep up the Spirit, we need to step in his steps. We need to be guided by where he goes. Otherwise, we run huge dangers and risks. We need to be guided by that spirit. You know, I think of our lives as, as if we are a kite. And, and the spirit blows. You know, the same word for spirit in, in the Bible is for wind. And it is the spirit that keeps that kite aloft. And it's beautiful, and it's fun, and it's up there. And when the Spirit is blowing, we can fly, and it's a wonderful thing, as long as we're tethered to the guiding hand that is God. If you've flown a kite, and you know the string breaks, the, chiros, the kite spirals out of control and comes to the ground. But as long as we're tethered to God's guiding hand, the Spirit can blow us. 
And then we can be up there and we can be beautiful and reaching the things, that, experiencing the things that God wants us to experience. As long as we are tethered to God's guiding hand, the Spirit can blow where he will blow, as Jesus says. And we'll experience that. And we can rise up. Let's decide to do that together, shall we? Let's pray together. Let's pray. Almighty God, we do confess that we are reluctant to let you loose in our lives. We are reluctant to let the Spirit have his way with us because we don't know what that means. We don't know where that's going. And we are afraid. So, Almighty God, in the quiet of this moment, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us. That you would speak to our fears and that you would convict our hearts. These places where we are following the flesh, when we're walking according to the flesh, Lord, we may have tried to rationalize and explain it away, but Lord, I pray that you'd convict our hearts through the power of the Spirit dwelling within us. But I also pray, Lord, that you would handle our fear. That you would tell us and convince us and show us that the good things really happen for us when we can remove the packaging. The packaging that contains and subdues the spirit. That if we can get rid of this thing, whatever it may be, for each one of us, that you can let that spirit loose. And that we might be transformed and become, become the kind of people you long for us to be. And we pray all of that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.